Dr. Sam Onange, very welcome this morning. He is a senior lecturer at Makare University, Kampala, at the College of Health Sciences in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. He's also the practicing clinician at Kawempe National Reference Hospital, and he has done lots of research in the reduction of maternal mortality and morbidity rates with a special interest in PPH or postpartum hemorrhage. He has 20 publications in peer-reviewed journals and he has supervised 24 post-grad post -grad students to completion. And then of course, he is also a member of the Uganda National Safe Motherhood Committee, ARGU and ESSACOG. So uh, his accomplishments and his achievements far extends this list but for today this is what we are focusing on and we are giving over to you Dr. Sam Onange to to share your insights and your uh your expertise thank you very much thank you so much uh, uh, uh TMK and Rita for that kind introduction let me allow me just to share the screen and I'd like to take this opportunity to add welcoming the members who are joining online to attend this webinar on this important topic uh, looking at PPH. And um, I'm also excited to share a little experience and some knowledge on especially the escalation management of PPH. And I appreciate uh, uh, Snappy Biomed for organizing this uh, series of webinars. So as from the last webinar we had last week, we had exhaustively discussed the emotive, but today we're going to look at the, the E part of dust escalation in the management of PPH. But let's remind ourselves on a few things about PPH. One is that uh, it remains the leading uh, cause of maternal mortality and from uh, WHO, approximately 14 million women experience people annually. That's actually a big number. Unfortunately, it still contributes about 27% of the maternal deaths. In some countries, it's high as 50. For us in Uganda, of all the deaths which are reviewed, PPH contributes about 34%. And the trend is not coming down over the last four years. It is almost stagnating. Now, from the last presentation, who was shown that the early detection and the first response bundle effectively controls uh, the bleeding for most of the women who experience it. And that's where we want to thank Professor Gadalansi when she took us through those details. And for those who did who are not there, please uh, uh, reach out to the YouTube of Sinape. There's a lot of information which uh, you can easily get from there. And from the presentation, we were informed that, uh, that the emotive was able to reduce 60% of the mortality and then also invasive management like the removal of the uterus. This is good news. And our prayer is that we should be able to move into that direction for us to save more mothers from actually dying. Now, when you have a PPH, the initial management is usually early recognition, and patient stabilization. And I wanted to share this slide from WHO, which reinforces what Professor presented last time. That is early detection, where you have, uh, when you reach a certain triggers, you should be able to say, no, I need to start this woman on treatment immediately. And the treatment includes massaging of the uterus, use of hydrotonics, transnamic acid, and IV fluids. And when we offer this is results in a res resolution of PPH, and we're able to reduce uh, the need for blood transfusion and even the use of the surgical maneuvers, which I'll discuss briefly. Now, for any facility or any setting to implement this, it requires systems and units to be ready. So emergency preparedness is very key because bleeding from uh, death from PPH sometimes happens in less than two hours. What you need is the medication should be available, the supplies to use should be there, and sometimes even the protocols to use, so that you don't need to um, think twice. You're able to refer to the protocols, but not to forget the human resource, 
the PPH response teams to be available. Because being one person is hard. You need another person to put up a drip, another one to massage, another one to draw a drug. And we, from the last presentation it says, when these are all given within 15 minutes, that forms the first care bundle and we are able to save these mothers. So in all this, we need to have uh, access for resuscitation very well, large bore kernels, and use the crystalloids, but also use other teams to ensure that you have blood uh, for grouping and cross matching, and also uh, blood investigations to be done, and not to forget to basically uh, emptying the bladder. But my emphasis today is discussing about this last E here. That's the examination and escalation, ensuring that the bladder is empty and identifying the root cause so that you're able to manage when the PPH continues uh, after uh, when, when you have failed motive. So what are some of the markers for successful resuscitation when you are doing all this is you are maintaining the woman's normal mental status. You're able to converse with her and she's able to communicate to you uh, ably. And uh, you're monitoring her blood pressure that the mean arterial pressure should be at least above uh, 60, 65, and also monitoring the adequate urine output. And if you're in a facility which has which is able to do some uh, pH, blood pH, you have a normal serum pH and the bicarbonate levels. However, what happens when you have emotive failing? Then you end up with what you call a refractive pH, and that's why you apply the escalation management. So refractory PPH is defined as uh, any hemorrhage requiring a second line intervention. And this may include the use of electronics, by manual compression of the uterus, and the uterine balloon tamponade or vacuum induced hemorrhage contraction of the uterus. There are devices which are still under research currently but also it might actually include surgical, surgical management. This is currently a definition which, are, uh, which we are using that when you institute some of this management, that means you have gone beyond the emotive and trying to arrest the bleeding as much as possible. Approximately 10 to 20% of the women who are diagnosed with PPH will, will be refractory. So we need to be aware about this and also prepare that what should we be doing when you have a refractory PPH? And when you get refractory PPH, these are the ones which are responsible for the majority of maternal motor morbidity and the maternal death. Now, from literature, there's not much literature about refractory PPH compared to PPH in whole, but most often it follows the, the four T's. That is the, the tone, tears, tissue, and then the thromboplasty. So it can follow any of them. However, from a, a study by Webner and the team where they looked at the, champ, the champion data, the champion trial data, a second analysis of that data, they were able to define that the causes for river PPA seems to have a different underlying factor from those that are responsible for first care bundles. And from that paper, they are able to show that if you took a hundred women who had who responded to the first care band, uh, fifty-three percent of them were due to renatony. Uh, however, if you took another category of those who did not respond and they were categorized refractory, you find that the atony contributed only about thirty-two percent. Lacerations on the other side made like a double, from twelve point two. 0.8% to about 28%. And there's another paper by Mausa actually says that tears were contributing about 50% of the refractory cases of PPH. And meanwhile, the placental abnormalities also doubled uh, from 5.6% to actually 11%. So you see that when you look at this, you see, and the trend is that Coming down from attorney, you see more cases of tears and more cases of placenta abnormalities, and which helps us that we need to pick this out. And from the same study, they were able to identify the following factors to be uh, uh, risk factors for refractory PPH. 
That is when you, women who are undergoing labor induction or augmentation, they're at risk of preferred PPH. Those who experience in tears or trauma, and then abnormal placentation, and then any baby which weighs more than 3.5 kilograms. We need to be ready. This is very important for us who in clinical setting that we are able to stratify these patients during the antenatal period, the prenatal period, that, so that you can link them to a facility which can manage them later. But also if they came out in labor, you're able to triage them to appropriate care. If your facility is not equipped enough, you say, I can't manage you because of one, two, three, four things, go to the next level where you can be cared for. And it helps those who have the facilities to prepare in advance in terms of having the necessary scale team, but also blood and also the other supplies which are necessary for the management of, uh, of refractory PPH. Now, some of the in interventions under escalation may include administration of additional heterotronics usually. If the woman has spent more than 30 minutes, you apply a second dose of transdermic acid. Then you evaluate for the underlying causes as you actually continue the resuscitation. You identify what is the underlying factor actually causing this and then you treat accordingly. But immediately we consider non-surgical interventions like uterine balloon tamponade and non-pneumatic shock garments. And I will discuss more slightly about each one of these. But the key thing is that don't wait longer. If you notice that the first a response bundle is not working, institute this management as soon as possible, including even surgery, which may involve repair of tears, the uterine compression sutures, and then also uterine reembolization if your patient is able to do it, and also removal of, uh, of the uterus. So if you identify that this mother has a tear from the examination, continue with the IV fluids but have a good place where you have good lighting for so that you're able to inspect the whole cervix, the whole vagina, identify the tear, and you can use a spatula basically to look at all the walls. The seam spatula is good. It helps you to identify all the walls, identify the tear. The moment you identify the tear, apply a ring forceps and, and repair in theater. Now for a midwife law, in the facility might not have, in a lower facility might not have a theater. What she could do is actually identify the, the torn area, apply to uh, a ring forceps or sponge holding forceps and refer this mother to the next level with the forceps in place. There you would have saved the blood loss during the transfer and as you wait even for definitely repair of the, of the tear. Now, when it comes to Management of uterine atony. The modality which, if the drugs are failed, we use a uterine balloon tamponade. And the, the mechanism of action which has been suggested, uh, there are two of them. One is that the UBT tends to stimulate the receptors within the uterus, and these receptors may initiate the contraction of the uterus. That is one. The second one, which is more obvious to everyone is a direct application of uh, hydrostatic pressure against the bleeding areas. And it's like when you have any cut anywhere, by just applying some pressure in that area, you find bleeding basically stops. And there are different types of uh, uterine balloon tamponade. The long time well-known one is the Bakra balloon, mostly used in the Western world who can afford it. But also we have the the Russian balloon, uh, as you can see from the diagram there, and the sunken black and more uh, balloon, which was used for esophageal bleeding, but also has found its use in obstetrics. The low cost one is the condom uh, balloon, which can be assembled, it's much cheaper. It's a condom, a four-length catheter, and a, a 50 ml syringe, if you can have it so that you can basically inflate it when you have introduced the already tied balloon in place. Sometimes you can actually connect a, a giving set, introduce inside, and allow it to behave like a, pro, a, a, a free flow system onto the uterine cavity. But lastly, the Elavi balloon, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side, it has a, a reservoir, a connecting tube, 
and the balloon itself, which has um, a valve which controls uh, basically when you allow the balloon basically to inflate. I will discuss slightly about uh, the uterine balloon, uh, the larvae uterine balloon tamponade, because we have used it in our place and it seems to be making dramatic um, saving of life from testimonies of colleagues who have used it in the field. Now, the step-by-step -step, uh, procedure for introduction of this is that, uh, as I showed earlier, the reservoir, which is up here, uh, has a cup. So you get in cold water, boiled or not boiled, you introduce it into the reservoir up to the mark, which is about like 1,000 mils. And then you, you connect it to the connecting tube, which is, uh, uh, which is this one here. But the connecting tube has a valve in place. You, the valve has to be closed as you connect it. Now, in step three, when you have evaluated, you introduce the, the, a, a larvae balloon into the uterine cavity as far as possible into the fundus. After the introduction of the uterine balloon into the uterine fundus, you maintain your hand around the cervix and then you open the tap with the left hand. Now, when you open the tap, it's you only open the tap after you have uh, raised it up, up to about 1.5 meters above the patient's bed. You will notice that when you raise the, when you open the tap, the water will flow freely into the uterine cavity and will cause, it will expand the balloon and as the balloon expands, it causes pressure onto the bleeding areas and the bleeding will definitely stop. So you maintain the balloon in place for a minimum of six hours. You can even go up to 24 hours, it is in place. However, sometimes the uterus can even contract as the balloon is in place. And you'll notice that since it's a, 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 a free flow tube, the water which is contained in the balloon goes back into the reservoir and you see the rise at the level of the reservoir and you're able to notice that actually the uterus has contracted now. But at the same time, you will be monitoring how is there any bleeding, what is the blood pressure, what is the pulse. That helps you to know that there is response to the treatment at this level and it's easy for you to also to see that more... more water in the reservoir is rising up because the uterus is actually uh, 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 is, is, is the uterus is actually contracting. This is the more easy thing to use and we have experimented it in our place in a few places and uh, several colleagues have given good testimonies of how effective the UBT in controlling bleeding within our own city it can be started by a midwife and uh, the doctors, so there's no need for a midwife to say, I'm waiting for the doctor to insert the, the UBT. I wanted to share about the existing evidence to support the use of the UBT. Suarez and group did a systematic review in 2020 where they reviewed the 91 studies, uh, six randomized control trials, one cluster randomized trial, and the 15 and randomized and the majority of them were case series. And they were able to show that out of the 4,729 UBT users in this review, the success rate was 85.9% in controlling severe PPH. And one of the comments which came from this review is that those studies which instituted uh, a, a UBT early enough, the success uh, is as high as 100%. So it brings to our attention that when you have a PPH and you think that you need to insert a UBT in Trenatoli, insert it, don't wait until the patient is severely shocked. The response is very better compared to if you waited when she's completely in shock. They also saw um, a cost-effectiveness study by Herrick in 2017, which looked at the use of the UBT, and they were able to show that it to be able to review to reduce 11 percent in the maternal death in the population uh, of those who use the UBT, and it was they were able to avert 10,000 
823 surgeries and prevent anemia in 634. You can see this is some of the things we need to base our argument for institutionalization of some of these devices. And on the implementation side, PAC and the group uh, actually in Ghana and Kenya trained about 451 staffs on the use of a lavi balloon. And they were able to show that approximately 80% of the trainees reported that the lavi was actually easy to use. So it is something which uh, uh, can be easily used by a midwife, by a doctor. Now, what is the position of WHO on the use of uh, a trend balloon tampon? Yes, WHO recommends it is used. And however, they put uh, uh, a caution that uh, it should not be in isolation. It should be in a setting where you're able to access other postpartum hemorrhage treatments, including possibly surgery. Because I think the argument is looking at the, 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 the effects. Yes, it is effective. However, when it fails, what happens next? You need where you can be able to, this woman to access surgery as much as possible. So WHO recommends its use, but when you look at our settings, the midwife in health center three, it can still help this midwife move the patient from health center three, maybe 10 kilometers away to a hospital if the bleeding if she, if this patient actually requires actually more treatment. I'm moving to the next uh, mode of uh, uh, management of E, that is the use of the non nemotic and shock garments. You have seen, I know majority of you have seen this. The, the mechanism of action of this is that it's basically shunts blood to vital organs such that you it is unsure, moving blood from the lower limbs and the abdomen into they were actually the vital organs. And you can use it during periods of transferring the patient from lower facilities or when you're waiting for a definitive management. And it can provide this stability for about actually 48 hours. It is easy to use and also easy to apply. And if you have a trained staff, about in 60 seconds, you would have actually finished the application of um, application of the NAST. And you don't need much training, you just need minimal training on, and the support of people basically to apply this uh, device. This application is, uh, is easily illustrated that you start from the smallest, the lowest segment, that's segment number one up to number six. And the segment number five has a ball pressure-like uh, application which directly you it causes pressure around the umbilicus and causing compression on the uterus. And the, the caution is that it should not be so tight because you have to use it just below the rib cage. You should be able to allow the patient to, to actually breathe comfortably. And the correct tight application, when applied in the lower abdomen and in the lower legs, uh, supplies about 20 to 40 millimeters of circumferential pressure, reversing back the hypovolemic shock. And you can see from the right hand side there, these are colleagues from senior colleagues from, from Uganda who are doing the training of, of some of the doctors and the nurses on the application of the, the NASC. And within, if you apply it, I've seen it work within two to three minutes, you see the patient who was not communicating to you, even the blood pressure comes up and is able to tell you where she is. And she's able to ask, where is my baby? Usually that's their concern. And the vital signs basically improve. Now, moving to the next is the use of the surgical management um, um, of PPH. And I've listed here some of them. I mentioned them earlier. Those are the compression sutures. Um, uterine devascularization is another one. And then arterial embolization and hysterectomy. You might not have all this in your facility, but you should be able to, if you're a surgeon or a doctor doing xeran section, you should be well equipped with the first one at least, and then the and then the last one in most of our facilities, which are actually low setting facilities. The compression sutures, uh, we have the billage uh, and the cho sutures, but you can also apply the multiple horizontal sutures. 
and also the Heyman sutures, which is basically like a loop. You start the suture from the lower segment, inside in the lower segment, and then you tie it on either side of the uterus, helping the uterus to contract. These are useful in, in terms of uterine atom. But sometimes you can just put uh, transverse interrupted sutures if you have bleeding spots within the uterus. This is when you want as much as possible to conserve the uterus of this prime with only one baby and you don't want to, uh, to miss the opportunity of producing the next few children of our family choice. The Billich suture uh, basically acts on when Atony fails and the, it was started by Billich in 1997 from the US and it is one conservative way of us managing PPH and in some early intervention. Don't wait. If you see that the uterus is not contracting, act on it as much as possible. The way it is inserted, you if you looked on the right hand side here, uh, you make after you have opened the abdomen through the laparotomy, you make an incision in the lower segment, like you're doing a zero section, and you make insert a needle just two centimeters below the incision, enter into the uterine cavity, come up two centimeters above the incision loop it over, go behind the uterus, and then you enter into the, the lower segment posteriorly, and you, you get out the lower segment, then you come up, and then you, you insert just two centimeters above the incision into the uterine cavity. You're able to see the sutures there, and then you get out. So with the help of an assistant who helps you to, to squeeze the uterus, causing it to contract, you tighten the two loose sutures in the end that enabling this uterus to contract as the, you watch even how much blood is coming from, from actually the perineum. So you can ask, ask another person, can you see, is there still much blood coming from, from the vagina after the assistance has contract? You tighten it and you close. It takes a short time and it saves the woman's uterus and he has been found uh, basically to, to save the uteruses. It can be done by a doctor who can do a zeran section and doesn't require so much skill, so long as you can follow the steps and an assistant basically to apply that suture in place. The Cho sutures on the other side was developed by Cho and colleagues in 2000, and it's just uh, multiple sutures which form like squares, form like squares. I'll show you in the next diagram both anterior and posteriorly. And this is more useful in areas where you find that they, they, you need lo there is localized bleeding and you need to compress uh, the uterine cavity to reduce the space within the uterine cavity. If you have any suture which is absorbable like chromic cut, cut or vicryl, you can use it and you apply pressure of the two walls together. And your suture has to pass through all the layers of the of, 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 of the myometrium and so that you can close the, the uterine cavity. As you can see from the diagram on the right hand side, these are boxes which just apply in those areas, uh, bring the two walls together and you're able to uh, obliterate the uterine cavity, also basically stopping the bleeding. However, in some situations, you can decide to customize it on two only the area which is bleeding, especially in placenta previa. If you have like in the lower segment, you have areas which are bleeding, you can apply those boxes into the bleeding areas of the placenta, customize for basically placenta previa. As you can see in the next slide here, this is the placental bed. So if you put boxes, it saves you. It is so annoying sometimes the area you, you apply pressure and then it just swells up. For surgeons in the group here, you find that the area just swells up with fluid, that is blood. You apply again as if it stops, it swells up. But when you apply the sutures in boxes, it basically achieves a hemostasis. And you can only do this on the side where the placenta is basically actually attached. So in this case, you you apply only on the placental bed. Now, in some situations, 
you might not need to put the boxes. You can just uh, apply the vertical switches. If you looked on the left hand side here, to obliterate the the lower segment, not completely. In the middle of these two vertical switches, there is space. So any blood which is collecting from up, which one's drain out can pass through there. But you put your vertical switcher here and another one here, it stops bleeding. In my own practice, I think sometime October last year, we had a very bad case of placenta previa and these two sutures here, the moment you apply them, control the bleeding within a short time and were able to uh, to save this woman from actually removing uh, her uterus. So as I come to the conclusion on escalation management, I've mentioned a few which are able to do in my majority of our settings is the opportunities for improving PPH outcomes basically depends on us as countries to focus on delivering high quality first line management as the emotive and in all facilities uh, from as low facilities to to referral facilities however for those low facilities we need to have a referral mechanism such that patients can who need referral can reach uh, the care and once they reach the that higher level they are able to access um, uh, uh, quality secondary care or the escalation management as soon as possible for those who are referred. But you can do all these referrals with the help of a good referral system. But if there is a tony, insert a UBT, and if there is a, a tear, you can actually apply um, a sponge holding forceps for you to arrest bleeding that you can reach the next level for where it can be referred. There is ongoing work research on the use of the different modes of uh, tamponets available. And I'm glad to report that WHO is doing a, a study in Vietnam where they're examining uh, different techniques of treating PPH, including the use of a lavi balloon, the condom balloon, but also the, the uterine suction devices, which are not yet in the, in the market, but they are available, and the use of the folate catheter. So need to keep um, maybe in the next year or so, the results from there might help us better which of the devices uh, are basically doing much better and uh, at a low cost and is able to help us save, uh, save the woman from, from any death. To conclude, PPH remains the leading cause of maternal mortality. And uh, as I mentioned, and from the previous webinar, emotive, is effective in reducing PPH mortality and invasive procedures. Important is early recognition and prompt treatment is very key, including the use of UBT, which is effective and safe. And uh, I believe uh, Temke and Rita will share with us about the, the cost of UBT, which we believe is, is really cheap for us to use in our setting. And the use of NAS can save the lives of mothers. Uh, reducing the blood loss and stabilizing the women and shields she gets the next help. So thank you so much for listening to me, some of the references for your own reading. And I'd like to appreciate you all for listening to me. Thank you. So once again, thank you so much to Dr. Sam Anungo and my colleague Temke for joining us for this webinar. And thank you so much for all our participants. I hope you have an amazing day further and we're looking forward to see you guys next week with our breastfeeding webinar. Thank you very much, Rita. So just a quick last thing, the link for the Unisafe product catalog is also shared in the chat and you are welcome to, to reach out to your ministries of health and they can apply through UNICEF or UNFBA to have the LRVs in your country. All right, but that is all from our side this week. Thank you, Dr. Sam, again, please show your face. Just uh, greet everyone with a lovely smile. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> nice having you, that's great. Thank you for having me, it's my pleasure. Thank you. All right, everyone, see you again next week. Breastfeeding, preparing the women, for the pregnant woman for breastfeeding with Dr. Marta Buerta. Until next week. Till next week. <laughs>